welcome to another edition of The Pedal Ship Project. The Pedal Ship Project is a series of conversations, thoughts, and experiments around the bike touring lifestyle. From tips and tricks to ideas on how to ride your ride, let's shrink the world by bike. Show notes and more are available at pedalship.net slash 086. And you can email the show, pedalship at pedalship.net. And check out the show also on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram. Very enthusiastic Hi everyone, it's Tim Marie, uh, back again for episode 86 of the Pedalship Project. Thanks for joining. I'm really excited to have you here. I've got a bunch of great things for this edition of the pod. I'm going to kick it all off with something I'm pretty excited about, and that is a little promo reel for Pedal Shift Tour Journals, Volume 8, Western Pen. Take it away, me. Pedal Shift Tour Journals, Volume 8, Western Pen. Can't see the end of the tunnel, that's how occluded it is. Ooh, SAT word. It's just so nice to be able to bike through a beautiful space like this. Why is this so hard? Why is this so hard? It's not like this is a real hill. Oh, shit, it's got a rattle at the end of it. I, I don't know if anybody else has that issue as well, but that, that seems to be my pattern. Of course, if you've been with the show for, well, I don't know, even two or three episodes, and you know that this is the uh, tour that I did, the uh, big uh five-day, 300-mile tour of western Pennsylvania along the uh, Great Allegheny Passage, the Panhandle Trail, the Montour Trail, and lots of other things in there, the city of Pittsburgh included, and uh, some great camping and some, as you heard, interesting aspects to that ride. So that's all over available at Pedal Shift Plus. And of course, Pedal Shift Plus has all of the tour journals available there, and uh, you can get those for about ten bucks a piece. I think they're, I think all of them are ten. I think maybe there's one that's uh, less because it's shorter. But um, those are really fun uh, ways to support the show, is because of course every purchase from Pedal Shift Plus helps to support the Pedal Shift project. So thank you all for considering, and I hope you enjoy that. First up on the show is Gear Talk. And on this edition of the show, we're going to be talking about saddles. Um, I am on the record, if you've been with the Pedal Shift Project for any period of time, for not really caring as much about saddles as other elements of the gear that I use. I don't know why that is. Um, Well, actually, I do know why that is. I don't know why this particular treatment of me is this way. I find that I can get away with a pretty stock saddle. Maybe it's just because my geometry, my physiology, whatever, uh, seems to work just fine with your st- yeah, average stock saddle. That may mean I have an average pelvis and average sits bones or something like that. Um, I know that that is not the case for so many of you out there and that having a proper saddle is something that is really important. So I thought I would spend a few minutes talking about that on this episode of the pod. So I think the first thing that I would say is, or I think the question that I would query is, do I need an expensive saddle? And the answer to that is a definite no, unless you do. <laughs> so I, I would say, as I've mentioned before, for my, my own personal uh, needs, it's not really the expense that's the issue. It's making sure that it's angled correctly and that the fit is correct. And that can be a real trick for so many people out there. Um, so the number one thing I would say is that expending a lot of money on an expensive saddle isn't necessarily a panacea. Um, the sub question to all of this is, should I get that Brooks saddle that everyone's talking about? And if you're not familiar with saddles, if you're kind of new to bikes or anything like that, Brooks is a brand of saddle. I think it's made in the UK, if I'm not mistaken. But it's um, most of them are made of leather. I think that they do have one vegan uh, saddle that's out there, uh, but they're they're considered sort of the creme de la creme of, of saddles. Now, not everybody likes them, but I think that generally speaking, um, they are well regarded in the bike touring jam, if you will. So the question I, I will repeat is, should you get that Brooks saddle that everybody's uh, talking about? And I would say maybe, maybe. Uh, how you sit matters way more than the brand of saddle that you have. Um, are you sitting, are you an upright person? Or do you have a bike that's more like a cruiser? There's plenty of you out there that would tour on a cruiser and have a much more upright seat- seated position. Um, are you more in a down position? 
which is a pretty typical position for bike tourists, especially if you've got drop bars, which I would I would bet, I would guess, just based on my experience, I'd say most bike touring setups use drop bars. So you're probably more in a down position. Or are you somewhere in between? That's sort of like me when I'm on uh, with my butterfly bars. Uh, I can kind of go in between an upright position and a down position. And sometimes eh, it's, it's really sort of quasi in between. How you sit will impact the geometry of the different parts of your sits bones in the saddle. So the saddle shape then ends up mattering as much as anything else for what kind of saddle that you get. So the the bottom line here is that there are a ton of different factors that you'll want to consider in all of this. And I'll talk about, uh, I've got a link in the show notes, and that's, of course, pedalshift.net slash 086 to a really good resource that talks about where you're going to be sitting on a saddle relative to the position that you take on the bike, up, upright, more down, somewhere in between. And that can be really helpful in kind of figuring out what kind of saddle shape that you're going to get. Because I don't know if anybody has ever been to a, your local bike shop, your LBS as we call it, um, you'll see there are all sorts of different shapes and sizes and really there's no way of knowing. I mean, some of them say, well, this is made for guys. And this is, this saddle's made for women and this saddle's made for, you know, terrain and this is a racing saddle, but it doesn't really speak so much to comfort with one exception. And that is the dreaded gel saddle or the gel cover to a saddle. A lot of times people are steered this way in bicycle touring because, oh, you're going to be on a bike for long periods of time. Well, you definitely want this gel thing because it's going to cushion you and it's going to feel a lot better. Well, I will say for me. And I think that generally speaking, gel saddles are a really terrible idea. Uh, And the reason is that you're going to be kind of shifting around a bunch. Your sits bones, and I've used that term a few times, I should mention it. Those are those two sort of pointy bones on on your backside that are typically what you end up putting pressure on on the saddle. It's really where you end up sitting, hence the name sits bones, right? Or sit bones. When you've got a gel saddle, those sit bones are going to slough around a lot because that that saddle's not going to hold them in one particular spot. It's not going to hold it on sort of the meat of the saddle. Um, you would think that maybe it would, that they would sort of cushion around it and maybe kind of give you a little divot inside that gel. But typically speaking, that's not how it works. You'll end up getting a lot of chafing going on. And so In my experience and in talking with other people, I found that the gel saddles end up being way more trouble than they're worth for most people. Now, I think an exception for that might be the upright riders out there. So if you're going to be in an upright riding position, then that's going to be a scenario where you're probably going to be sitting on a nice wide saddle and you're not going to be moving all that much just because of the nature of how you sit. And that goes back to the beginning of what we were talking about there. So a gel saddle might be a possibility in that scenario or one of those covers, but I would say for the most part that you should steer away from those types of things. Um, and, And the only reason why I throw a caveat in there is that everyone's geometry is different. Everyone's riding style is different. So I never like to say always or never in scenarios like this, but I would say that you shouldn't consider that a panacea for your ills. Um, speaking of chafing. I've talked about this on the show before, and again, I'm on record on this on how I solved my issues with chafing and saddle sores. So I thought it would be a good time to repeat that here when we're talking about saddles, because I used to think that it was what I was wearing or what I was, or what my saddle was. I I considered, oh, wow, I've got to get a Brooks because I'm getting lots of saddle sores. Well, what I ended up discovering for me, again, for me, this doesn't necessarily mean that it's the case for everyone out there, but what I ended up discovering was I ended up chafing and I ended up having problems because I was getting too moist down there. And again, you know, these are, these are sort of private areas. So I'm going to dance around it a little bit here. What I found was that I would sweat a lot. I'm a sweater. I sweat when it is, um, oh, I don't know, 72 degrees Fahrenheit. I mean, I, I, I sweat quickly and easily. What happens is that I'll sweat down my back and then the, the, it dribbles right down there and it dribbles in there for lack of a better way to put it. And because I'd have that wetness down there that would never quite dry right, 
that would lead to chafing. So it wasn't so much my saddle. It was my sweat. So what I did was, and I've talked about this before, I'll take a bandana and I'll roll it up into kind of a tube and then I'll put it along my belt line and tuck it in uh, between my shorts and my skin, basically. And I don't wear padded shorts anymore. I don't, I, I wear, uh, you know, uh, wicking uh, synthetic underwear. You can do wool if you'd like. I know Mysterious James likes wool. But uh, for me, that ended up being the solution. Um, also, making sure that I took plenty of breaks to make sure that it never got too wet down there and i know that sounds so weird but you know hey we have to deal with these things uh, that really has solved the chafing issue for me so as a result it never ended up being the saddle and arguably when i was wearing padded shorts that actually was making it worse because what, it, what was happening was the moisture was getting soaked up in that padded area and it ended up being a lot worse so I don't use chamois cream or any of those other kind of uh, lubricants uh, that are out there because I don't need to. But that's for me. I know that so many people out there do need that because they've got maybe more sensitive skin or whatever. Um, but that's one thing that you may want to consider trying if you're finding that that would help eliminate chafing. Chafing can happen also because you have the wrong saddle. That's why I was talking about it in the context of this. So a little sidebar there. One uh, thing that I would recommend beyond taking a look at the, the thing in the show notes that I've got that will help you with saddle shape is to check out your local bike shop. Um, so many of them can be so helpful with finding the right saddle fit for you, especially if the folks that are there have any kind of experience with bike touring or at least riding long distances. Um, road bikers who do centuries or, you know, real long rides, they've got some good things to say about this as well, although they're going to be looking at it more from a weight perspective sometimes. Um, very often you'll hear a lot of road folks say, well, you shouldn't really be sitting in the seat all that much anyways. You really should be standing in the pedals more. And you'll hear that in the touring forums as well. Uh, and and that's not incorrect, I think. But I, I also think that different styles of riding have different needs. And I do think having a saddle that supports you at least a little bit is kind of important. Even though, yeah, you are in a sense going to be putting a little bit more of your stance in your legs to a certain degree. Doing that over the course of 50, 60, 70 miles um, with a fully loaded bike going uphill, I mean, it's not realistic all of the time. And that's why I think that a saddle has to give you some kind of support for at least a little bit. So talk to the folks at your local bike shop. Um, make sure that it's being fitted correctly. And if you've never adjusted your saddle other than height, you really want to take a look at where it sits on the rails because that's really going to be important for making sure that your sit bones are seated in the right place portion of your saddle. So depending on your saddle shape, you know, your sits bones go into a pretty obvious spot. There's going to be kind of the meat of the saddle where they should end up. And it should really feel like that when you sit in that saddle, that things, it sort of fits, you fit into it, that there, you're not constantly moving and adjusting. Or if they, you are, it's just minor adjustments mainly because you're you're sort of um, needing that as you adjust on your ride. Because again, we ride long distance. Um, one other thing at some local bike shops, and I'm going to give a real shout out to Gladys Bikes in Portland. Um, they, they have a saddle library. I don't think that that is common enough, but I love that they have this. And what it is, is you can literally check out a saddle and borrow it for a night or two. I can't remember what their the amount of time it, it that they have for that, but um, you could try it out. And that is really, really important to be able to do if you've got the opportunity. So between talking to people, um, comparing different types of saddles, and maybe if you're lucky enough to have a saddle library at your local bike shop, all of these types of things can give you the right information and the right tools to find the right saddle for you. Saddles are very personal choices. I have found that because I don't have real high-end needs or very specific needs, well, I'm not talking about it a lot on the show. And that's why I thought, oh, yeah, 86 episodes in, it might be a good idea for me to talk about it a little bit more because I know that my experience is not the same as everybody else's. I've talked to and I've um, read on forums and, and all sorts of different interactions ha I've had with people 
seen that there are some people that can't do anything but be on one particular brand of saddle that for some reason no other brands work. I think that that's where the Brook saddles come in and that's why you hear about them a lot because they are very comfortable once they break in. Um, but they're not necessarily for everyone and they're not necessarily comfortable for you, especially at the beginning. Um, also with a leather saddle or a product that's similar to that, and there are other leather saddles other than Brooks, there's some maintenance aspects to it as well. I have uh, the stock saddle that I have, and I forgive me, I don't know the brand name for it, but it's it's one of those brands that come stock on so many bikes out there on, on REI bikes and whatnot. Um, I've had the same saddle since the, the day I bought this bike, uh, the, the Navarro Safari that I still ride. The, the, the Safari isn't even sold anymore by REI. Pour one out for the Navarro Safari, everyone. But that saddle is going strong, and it's got some nicks and cuts in it, but it's still doing fine. Um now, does that mean that I'm going to have to replace that saddle with one just like it? No, probably not, because like I said, I know what my needs are. And as long as I have it adjusted properly, eh, it seems to work pretty well for me, no matter what brand of saddle it is. I've got a Brooks on my Brompton. Works really well. I enjoy it. I'm still kind of getting used to it in some ways, and I've even toured on this bike and intend to tour on it again. So a lot of this is also getting to know your saddle and getting more experience riding. That's the number one thing. You know, you can listen to dopey podcasts like this all the time and you can read Crazy Guy on a Bike and, uh, you know, all of the various resources out there. And there's a ton of them. And thank you for choosing this one for this particular moment. But, you know, it's your own experience that's going to inform you the most. So that's what I would have to say about um, making sure that you've got the right saddle and the best bike touring saddle for you. Don't listen to other people and think that their experience is necessarily going to be your experience. Try out things when you can and make sure that your sit bones are seated properly. And don't be afraid to hop off your bike a ton of times and grab that Allen wrench and readjust that saddle, even small bits, forward, backward, up, down, you know, making making that, those adjustments until you find that right thing. And then I would really recommend take a picture of it and take a picture of it from underneath too so that you know exactly where things are. If you've got a Sharpie, make a mark around where that um, – uh, where it's sitting on the rails. All of those things are really important. We do that for saddle height too, hopefully. If you've been doing, if you haven't been doing that, I would recommend that you do that. Frankly, I need to do it again because my, my Sharpie mark has worn off my saddle height. Uh, but those are the types of things that will make a huge difference. Trial and error, making sure you've got the right thing and talking to a lot of people and just assessing it all because you are a unique butterfly <laughs> and your sit bones are unique as well. And that is really important to accept and understand before you say, oh, I absolutely need to get this particular type of saddle because Tim on pedal shift uses a saddle or, or this person does, or the person that I, I know who's done bike touring says the only thing they can ride on is a Brooks. Um, those are great and those are good experiences and it's good data, but it's not necessarily the thing that will work for you. So try lots of things out and, uh, make lots of adjustments and ride your ride back in the show notes, pedalshift.net slash zero eight six. I've got a link to cyclingabout.com and it's an article called saddle comfort for cyclists, the best bicycle touring seats. It is a really good, it's comprehensive, it's got a lot of good gra um, uh, pictures and diagrams, and I think that it's a great resource, so go check that out, and then make sure that uh, you're riding your correct saddle for you. Next up on the show is Connections, and I, we've got, let's see here... Follow up on Hiker Traditions podcast. And of course, we did that uh, last episode, I think, if I'm not mistaken. And we've got new listener, Paul Brennan. Hello, Paul. Paul writes, when you started with bump boxes, I was like, yes, I use bump boxes hiking as well as biking. The thing you need to get used to while biking is you move so much faster than hiking. You need to bump your box way ahead to make sure you do not beat your box to its destination. I did this hiking and I did not log that many miles in a day. General delivery boxes are not given high priority by the Postal Service, so you need to be prepared to have it sent back to your home return address. And I had forgotten to mention that 
that you're going to want to make sure that you put a return address on that because after X amount of time, they will return it to sender. That way you won't lose the stuff if you do miss your bounce box. So he calls, I call it a bounce box. He called it a bump box. There's lots of different names for this. Uh, Paul continues, uh, the half gallon challenge. You said Virginia, it's actually Pennsylvania. Mea culpa. I did not realize that. Uh, Pennsylvania, the great Commonwealth. Um, it's easier said than done. I didn't even try it. The day I got halfway was so hot. I couldn't have eaten a Dixie cup, let alone a half gallon. I got there midday and I would have needed a long time to get my body even close to being able to do that. That's really interesting because, you know, I keep hearing this thing called hiker hunger and I assume it's kind of similar to biker hunger. Uh, when I'm on a long tour, uh, I'll, I'm pretty sure I could eat the shit out of a half gallon of ice cream under the right conditions. But um, I guess those weren't the right conditions for you, Paul. Sounds like that it's harder than it looks. Uh, Paul continues. The trail magic is cool, too. The Trans Am had a cookie lady, the cookie lady, I should say, RIP. She passed away, I want to say, a couple of years ago. And I believe if I'm not mistaken, this is, if memory serves, Michael Riesick, a friend of the show who was on, on the show last year, um, he's actually, a sidebar, he's got uh, some really cool adventures coming up. Yeah, he's uh, not on a bike this summer, but he's with his dog and he's going to be uh, van dwelling throughout the summer and has no particular end in sight. So uh, go check out his blog for all of that. Um, and in any event, he wrote about the cookie lady. So I'm I'm well, well um, acquainted with the cookie lady. She seemed like a really cool person and was the epitome of trail magic for trans am bicyclists. Anyways, Paul continues, uh, the cookie, uh, uh, Trans Am had the cookie, trail magic, uh, yada, yada, yada. Oh, the difficulty is through hikers are pretty well condensed. So it's easy to do something for a lot of them at one time. Cycle tourists are more spread out. So it's a little harder. I think that's totally true. And the, but the one thing that I would say is that you may not be able to serve if you choose to do some trail magic for a particular biker. But you um, you might be able to sort of be in one spot. Let's say that you're going to be in a spot for a week or two or something like that. And maybe you live near a route. Well, maybe you can put out a cooler full of water or something like that, like I experienced in Pennsylvania. You can hear my cat freaking out right now. I should edit this out. I probably won't, though. Yes. We're talking about Trail Magic Jackson. You cool with that? He's cool with that. In any event... Um, you could put out a cooler like the folks in Pennsylvania did that I talked about um, on the last episode or two episodes ago, I think it was. So you, I think you can do things. I, I do think it's different. Um, with the Appalachian Trail in particular, you find that most of the hikers go from south to north to begin with. And the ones that are intending to through hike, they start within probably 30 to 45 days of each other. And so, yeah, you get a ton of people going through at one time and you can serve a lot of people if that's what you want. We also have things like, oh, uh, uh, warm showers. So in that way, that's sort of trail magic in its own way for bicyclists, too. So I think there's lots of different ways to do it, but I definitely hear what you're saying there, Paul. Um, two other suggestions that Paul had uh, that he wanted to add were um, trail names and some sort of trail journals in shelters. I think that that's really interesting. And as I wrote back to Paul, I said, I consider trail names, but boy, that seems culturally very different. It, it seems to be like when you hike the AT, if you don't have a trail name, you're given one. For me, I don't know why it's never really um, been something that I would want. So if I was hiking, I, I just don't think I would really want that. I So... I don't know if that culturally fits or if it's just my own bias that it's like, eh, I don't think I really want that. So I don't know. I'd be curious what you all think. If uh, having a trail name while you're out on a big, long tour would be something that you'd want. Uh, trail journals and shelters. I've actually seen them uh, in Connellsville, Pennsylvania, for instance. Those Adirondack shelters that are behind the grocery store, um, those have uh, trail journals. So you'll see them periodically, but not. it's not culturally as ingrained in bike touring as it is in long distance hiking. So I, I think those are two interesting ideas. I, I know that for me, I don't think I would be as into trail names, but trail journals I've seen. I'm curious what everyone thinks. Um, thanks, Paul, for writing in. And I'm glad to hear that that resonated with you as a long distance hiker. Something I've never really done, but like I said, I'm kind of drawn to it because I think that it's a close cousin of bike touring. And uh, I think we can learn a lot. And that's why we did that episode. So Paul, thanks so much for listening. And thanks for Chiming in. Next up in connections. And oh, by the way, I should mention uh, in connection section, you can 
Email the show, pedalshift at pedalshift.net. That goes right to me. We've got comments in the blog. We've got, let's see, Instagram comments, got Facebook, all sorts of different ways to get in touch. So reach out that way. Um, oh, and the lightly used pedal shift voicemail. Um, I don't even remember the number, but it's in the show notes. Every single one of the show notes. Call and leave a message, especially if you're on tour. In fact, I'm going to throw out a, a request right now before I get to the next section of the connections. I would love to hear from you while you're out on rides. doesn't even have to be a tour. If it's out for a cool day trip, I'd like to start collecting some of those things. So call the Pedal Shift hotline. It's in the show notes, pedalshift.net slash 086. Number's right there. Go check it out. It's lightly used. I don't think I've gotten one in a long time. So call. You might find yourself on a future episode of the pod. Next on Connections, we have another five-star review. Um, five-star reviews I always like to read on the show. So here we go. One of my favorites from Dave, D-A-V, one, two, three, four, five, six. Dave, I'm concerned about your passwords. I'm concerned about your passwords. That's all I'm saying. Dave, one, two, three, four, five, six. Pedal Shift has grown into one of my favorite podcasts. Host, hey, that's me, always provides helpful information and most importantly, inspires me to do more bicycle touring. Has definitely changed how I bike and how I see the biking world. Great job. I highly recommend. Dave, thank you so much. I want you to have a strong password. No more of these one, two, three, four, five, sixes. I know that's not your password, but I'm just concerned about that. Um, and thank you for the five star review. I really appreciate that. Thank you for listening. Thank you all for listening because, um, I wouldn't do this if you weren't. <laughs> I'm just going to be straight up with you. I enjoy bike touring. I enjoy talking about it, but ah, if you weren't out there, eh. Kind of be talking to myself, which is sort of what I'm doing right now with a microphone. So, you know, six of one, half a dozen of the other. And we like to close out the show as always with a big thank you to all of our supporters of the Pedal Shift Project. If you like what you hear, you can help maintain Pedal Shift as an independent, listener-supported voice while expanding the offerings. Five bucks, two bucks, or even one buck a month helps with the cost of hosting the podcast, the website, Pedal Shift tour journals, all of that. And you can do it for a bit and cancel any time. One-shot support is welcome if you're not into the small monthly thing, so check it all out at pedalshift.net slash society. On to the society. Ethan Georgie, Kimberly Wilson, Caleb Jenkinson, Cameron Lane, Andrew McGregor, Michael Hart, Josiah Matthews, Keith Nagel, Brock Dittis, Thomas Skadow, Seth Krieger, Marco Lowe, Terrence Manson, Noah Schroer, Harry Telgadis, John Sikorsky, Richard Killian, Chris Barron, Scott Taylor, Brian Wren, Mark Van Ram, Brad Hipwell, Paul Mulvey, Stuart Buckin, Todd Stutz, Mr. T, Roxy Arney, Nathan Poulton, Harry Hugel, Ferguson Meek, Stephen Dickerson, Vince LaGreco, Ruth Divorcey, Michelle Miller, Matthew Lewis, and new to the pod, Michael Baker, and Billy Crafton. And thank you all to past contributors and anonymous supporters of the show. Thank you for joining. You can find Pedal Shift at pedalshift.net. Lots of great content. You can hear the Pedal Shift Project through iTunes or your favorite podcast aggregator. Opening music courtesy of Jason Kent off his debut album. The track is called America. Check out his band Sunfield's latest release, Habitat, wherever cool music is available. 